Well, Yama, everyone. First and foremost, I pay respect to the traditional owners of country. I come to you from Gamilaroi land, which is where I live and work. And other speakers today are coming from Uralarai lands and Gadigal lands. I pay deepest respects to the traditional custodians of country and the elders and knowledge holders who've nurtured it for thousands of years. Also, I know each one of you listening who also belongs to a family and a community, and I pay my respects to them as well. There are people joining this webinar from all over the continent with a desire to see native grains grow strong in our country and back in our foods. The species, the ecosystems, the cultures around these grains are going to vary across the continent. But I trust that during these short webinars, we can share a bit of knowledge and connect the dots from the field all the way through to people's homes and their food. As implied in the title, this is a knowledge sharing series of webinars, not a series of lectures. Um, we've done this very much on purpose because the system is really complex and no one has all the answers. So, and, and least of all me. So we're going to join together with leaders and experts in their individual disciplines, with community members, to share a little bit of expertise about the practicalities of working with native grains. We're gonna split this over three sessions so that we can see it from the whole production chain perspective. Um, and so when I say the production chain, I mean seed starts as soil on country. And then over a few years, it grows to produce the plants and produce the grains. And then these are harvested, cleaned up and processed, but maybe by milling, kibbling, soaking, and then they're cooked into a food. And then they're passed on to the consumer for the yummy bit, and that's the eating. So we're gonna look at this whole production chain over these series of three webinars and in their economic, environmental and cultural context. But we're actually gonna start for, with the end and work backwards. So today, the webinar is about the food products. Um, we're not gonna have a webinar next Tuesday because it's NAIDOC week, so we can all celebrate, but we'll be back the Tuesday after for session number two, and that will be on the growing and processing. Um, we're gonna talk about the equipment, the field preparation, um, the threshing, the harvesting, what type of seed you might want to buy and why. And then finally, we're going to finish with a session on the business side of the production chain. So that's um, not navigating cultural governance for people from all cultural backgrounds. We're also gonna talk about where you might be able to get some training um, for whatever part of the production chain you sit at. These webinars have been supported by Northwest Local Land Services. And we're grateful not only to the guys there um, for these webinars, but also for the other on the ground activities that we partner with um, them up here on Gomorrah country. Um, and we do this going forward even more every day. I'm sure there's gonna be time for questions at the end of each of these three sessions. So if you have a question, just um, down the bottom of your screen, you should see a little chat symbol. And if you click on that, you can type a question and you can do that at any point, um, but you feel free to wait till the end as well. Um, and then when we get to the end, I'll have a look at the questions and pick out some of the common ones and we can um, ask them of our speakers. And then finally, if you or a colleague miss any of the three sessions, it's no worries. They, the recordings are gonna go up on the website and these recordings can be freely shared, um, distributed to all. Cause like I said, this is knowledge sharing, um, the more the merrier. So without further ado, this morning, we are absolutely honored to be joined by Auntie Beryl from the National Center of Indigenous Excellence. Auntie Beryl is originally from Walgut, which she's an entrepreneur, a chef, and now a trainer of chefs. She runs a catering operation, which supplies natives foods while she teaches her students at the National Center for Indigenous Excellence. Um, and this is at Redfern, and I encourage you to have a look at their website and their operation. It's absolutely incredible. So, Auntie Beryl, thank you very, very much for joining us today, and over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, whose land I'm on today, and the uh, other 29 uh, Aboriginal um, people in the, in the Sydney region, our tribe, and my own country which is Camilla Roy. I always get teary when I talk about home. But anyway, I'm here to uh, give whatever I can back to community. 
have been out there for over the past 50 years trying to uh, promote what we got and it's finally happening for me in Sydney and it has been for a while and to share our culture and our foods with the young people that I get involved with in and around the city, um, getting them prepared to go out to work as well. So can you hear me? Can you hear me? So what I've done is um, because I've been developing recipes myself over the years, I thought I'd try the flowers uh, the, and the seeds that I received from you guys up there and come up with the recipe. And I've already tested these recipes out on my colleagues here at work at NCIE and they love what I made. So the, grain, uh, the seeds that I used is the pigweed seed and I made muffins. So you can, this is very simple. Um, I just mixed it with some um, organic um, self-raising flour, nothing really flash and put the seeds in and it, it turned out and the muffins are so beautiful. And it's a very simple recipe. Um, and everybody in my colleagues said they loved the muffins with the pigweed seed. Uh, my husband said he loved the muffins because he's my first port of call. I did it on own. Um, and the flour is um, the grass flour, which is really fine. But if you mix it with self-raising flour or plain flour and a little bit of baking powder, it works the same. I've been using seeds and uh, the lemon myrtle uh, for many years now and uh, using it in my own catering company and it's been quite successful. And at NCIE, we uh, do specialise in bush tucker and we are now catering for corporate world, which took us quite a few years to get a partnership with them, but it's happening. So any of you thinking about later on down the track, once this, the grains have been out there and you've already reaped the grains and uh, can do anything at home and make up your own muffins, um, there will be a market for it, I'm pretty sure, because people want to try different things. Um, I've been fortunate enough to travel overseas and take our culture and uh, talk about Walgut and where I grew up because I grew up on the riverbank up there and I'm just so proud to be a part of what we're doing today and to see the fruits of my work come to what I'm doing here today in front of a, a camera, who would have thought? And everybody from community, no matter which community you come from, this can make a pathway for you as well. But I know with the flour, it's uh, a fine flour at the moment, but it worked. I cooked some Johnny cakes as well. I wanted to try it. I didn't have an open fire, but I did it in my electric fry pan and it worked. So you can do that. Um, we're fortunate enough today to make up some scones with the lemon myrtle, which is a bush as well. So it's a native plant. So you could grow that in your own backyard. So some of these seeds are now out there that you can grow them and what you're doing with the grass and the grains up there, and it's not going to take too long to put it out there. With the flower also, the grass flower, I made up some damper and everybody loved it. So, and that was just the grass flower, um, organic self-raising flower, which you buy at Coles and I bought the Coles brand so it works. And, um, yeah, everybody loved the taste and the flavour. And with this seed here, the dong uh, on grass, that could go in a biscuit or that can go in any, of, I would say, um, bread. So you can use the flowers for almost any of these grains here from the, that the flowers made out of and use it in your own cooking. And it's, I found it easy to work with. It's a little bit fine, but you'll get the consistency of it and mix it up. Um, but it looks great, it tastes great, and I was honoured to be a part of it. And you can also make bread out of it. So it's up to you. The uh, pigweed seeds, to me, they were very similar to poppy seeds, but they do have a flavour of their own. And it tasted a little bit salty to me, uh, not a lot of salt, 
but it's crunchy. It's much crunchier than the poppy seed. So I reckon that'll be a seller. <laughs> so when you take it to market, but this is what it's all about. And it's time to get it out there now in a big way. I've been putting it out there for the, like I said, the last 40 years or so. And I've always been passionate about it and it's coming to fruition for me. And now I'm teaching the kids in uh, Redfern and a lot of our kids now are employed at NCIE in the kitchen and they have to know about what they're putting into the food. And um, we have a young Aboriginal chef there now. He comes through our program and I'm very proud of him because he's actually using what we use here through uh, our kitchen. But I'm very proud to be a part of today. Any questions? <laughs> I'm a teacher, so that's why I ask that. But I'm so proud to be a part of it. And hello to all you ladies. I'm sure I'm related to some of you. <laughs> <laughs> Auntie Beryl, I just there's a message that came up from the Narrabri High School. They send their regards as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure I'm related to the mob up there too. <laughs> <laughs> So perhaps you could share about, you just mentioned pigweed. I have one quick question. Are there any food safety concerns about any of the species that you've cooked with? So did you, for example, need to soak or roast any of the seeds to make them safe? No, I just put the pigweeds in my muffin mix and, and cooked it in the oven, baked it in the oven, just like you would uh, um, uh, normal, uh, like if I was using poppy seeds. Wow. And the flour, I just mixed it up with the um, organic self-raising flour and some water. I didn't use milk or anything in the bread or the flatbread or the Johnny cakes or the damper because the damper comes out of the same dough as the Johnny cakes. And all it was is, was um, grass flour, water and the self-raising flour I used. That was it because that's what I grew up with. We had no milk and whatever then until we got introduced to sunshine milk, powdered milk. And I still make my damper with powdered milk, but I wanted to try the flour just as it was with the water. So it worked. So when you mix the flours together, what proportion do you normally use when you're mixing a native grain flour with the organic Well, what I did was I had two cups of self-raising flour and one cup of um, just the grain flour, but I ended up putting another half a cup. So it'd be two and a half cups of um, self-raising flour and one cup of uh, gra grain flour. That's amazing. Because the grain flour is a more uh, finer. Well, so, there's plenty more questions coming in, but I, yes. I heard before you were going to cook something on the barbecue. Is that right? Yes, I'm cooking up. I marinated some kangaroo in native pepper because I use all the native ingredients that I can get my hands on. And I'm going to throw that on the barbecue and put some um, a bush tomato chutney on it. Fantastic. Would you want to start that process now? Yes, we're all ready to go. Great. Thank you. You're right, girl. This has been marinated in a little bit of oil and native pepper. You could, if you haven't got kangaroo, but you can buy kangaroo now, woolies and coals. And I've just topped this up finely. It doesn't take long to cook. You could use a fry pan at home if you haven't got a barbecue.
and it's very healthy. There's no fat in kangaroo. It only takes a few minutes, takes about 10 minutes to cook. It's very tender. Very healthy. So that's what we ate. And all our native foods, all whatever we ate off our land when we were growing up and young, we, I remember going fishing all the time because that's what we ate. Lots of fish, lots of, lots of river cod, lots of yellow belly. And we try and keep our diets down here healthy because that's what we have to look to more is healthy eating. We have to get back to the, uh, that because our health is so poor. We have to get back to living off the land. And I think with COVID, that's what a lot of people are doing now. I know a lot of young women around Redfin and around other suburbs and people that I know in Sydney. And my sisters are starting to cook for themselves again. And I think that's great. To go with this today, we also have a salad. So the girls are going to enjoy some lunch with us. So I've just mixed up some uh, salad dressing and that will be tossed on a plate. Work. You want to give a look at this? <laughs> so that's just the mixed pulse salad that we're going to have for lunch. Very healthy. And we're just about ready to go. And you go see it out there. the bush tomato chutney so I'm just going to pour that over the top and that'll give it a bit of flavour. All good girls, you getting that? So now we're just about to throw it onto the platter and then it's ready to go. Doesn't take a long cooking time. I'm feeding the camera people today. But we always had healthy diets when I was growing up because we didn't have a lot, but we had a healthy food. We always ate fresh food. And I maintain that to today and I bring it into the classroom and I bring it into my own family. And 
I think everybody's starting to get back to eating healthy because of COVID and cooking for themselves at home. So there's the kangaroo ready to go. Want it up the front? You want it up the front, no? I hope our oysters were all down there sharing it with me. <laughs> oh, Gaba, that is incredible. There are so many people in the, the chat, Auntie Beryl, that are incredibly jealous they can't be there to join you. Don't worry, we'll all meet up. We'll have a yarning circle when I come home. <laughs> I'll come to Walgett. <laughs> we're halfway anyway. <laughs> when, when COVID is over. <laughs> so may I ask you a couple of questions? Yes. While you're cleaning up? Yep. Um, somebody asked, could you please repeat what was in your room marinade? I just... A bit of oil, uh, oil and uh, native pepper. Some of the ingredients you can buy in the shops now, they used to sell them at cold, some of the native ingredients, uh, but you can get a lot of the stuff online now from different uh, suppliers. So you just either uh, Google uh, bush foods or native foods and then you'll be able to do it at home. So if people wanted to cook at home um, with only native ingredients, is there a native cooking oil that you use or you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of at this stage. The closest to it would be the macadamia, macadamia, nut oil, or macadamia oil. Mm -hmm. That would be the closest to an oil, right? Mm -hmm. That I would use. So do you know from um, some of your elders that might have passed on knowledge, did they used to use oil when they were cooking no. over coals? No, we used the, we used the, uh, rendered down the fat from the sheep and the cattle. Ah. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think now it's become some form of lard or something mm. that you can buy in the supermarket. There's another question here from someone asking, have you published a cookbook or could you publish one? Uh, that's on the card. First of all, I'm doing my story with another friend in Sydney, Arnie Alley, and then there will be a cookbook coming out soon. Fantastic. But if anybody wants to know anything, they can always find me at NCIE or get in contact with me through you. Um, yeah, I'm always available to anybody in the community. Special, thank and you. And I'm a good sharer because that's what I learned when I was growing up. Mm. Something we all have to learn. Um, <laughs> Definitely something we all have to learn. Yeah, but I'm very happy that I know a lot of the young people in Redfern are now cooking for their children. And if you, uh, there's nothing wrong with going to Macca's. You go one day a week, set up. Don't tell me, set our fire alarm. I haven't got a fire here. I wasn't going to cook on the open fire. <laughs> I'd love to. But it's all good. And I'm happy to be a part of it and, and showcase what I've done over the years. And I've been fortunate enough to do it, but I persevered with it. And it happened for me and it can happen for any of you guys out there on country. Because we've all got something to share with other people. And I've been fortunate enough to travel overseas and go to different Indigenous countries. As far away up as Sweden in the past the Arctic Circle and share our culture with them and what we did 
when I was there, I lived on rain, around reindeer because that was there as a food and, and salmon. I ate more salmon than I did reindeer. <laughs> but it's great. It's been, it's taken me over to a few countries and I've survived and I know Aboriginal people are, we're all survivors. And if our spirits will never be broken and I'm sure this is going to come to fruition for all you guys out there. Yeah. Wow. Well, Auntie Beryl, we are so honoured that you would share with us today. Thank you very, very much. No, thank you for me, from me, from the bottom of my heart, from sharing with you all what I've been through and, you know, it hasn't been an easy road because when I was growing up and 18, we had no rights. But here am I today doing what I'm doing in front of a, what is iPhone? <laughs> How cool is that? And if you wanted to, girls out there and women out there, if you want to Google Auntie Beryl, you'll find me. Uh, just Google Auntie Beryl. That's all you have to do. And then you'll see what I have really done. And, you know, my daughter said to me, Mum, have you ever Googled yourself? I said, why would I want to Google myself? <laughs> but anyway, so I'm, I'm on Google. So thank you so much for having me and sharing your time with me. And we'll catch up soon. May the spirits of our land stay with you and guide you on your next journey. Thank you. Oh, Maraba. And if you could please stick around for a little bit, um, yep. there might be some more questions that'll come through as the other speakers share. Yeah, that'll be one done. No problem. I'm here, I'm going to be cleaning up now and the girls here will have, uh, I've shared the lunch with them and yeah, it's all good. Great. We're going to head you. from Redfern up to okay. Bogabilla now. Um, all right. <laughs> so up near the New South Wales Queensland border. We're about yeah, I know where Bogabilla is. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody in Bogabilla. <laughs> Yama, auntie. Yama. <laughs> Yellow. <laughs> so up in up in Bogabilla are Auntie Bernadette Duncan and Ada, who's from Tumala. And Auntie Bernadette leads the Gadigal Women's Language and Culture Network. And they've been meeting with the women for healing and connection to country and working to restore diets that are rich in native grains and URT. They also have some special grain storage and knowledge. And we're very honoured to be joined by Bernadette and Ada this morning. So, Auntie, over to you. Yama, everyone. Yama and I. Um, we haven't really started. We've got a big day planned next Monday with Johnny Cakes and Yurara on the riverbank to try and get people um, to come or start thinking about um, traditional food and um, as a healing um, healing practice to start getting back into traditional food. So, if we get um, the grains and start producing our own grains and flour. Um, it's going to help, especially a lot of our old people um, who've been living for decades on all the white flour and salt and um, fat, and it's really made them all sick in, in, in the belly and they can't explain it. They don't know what's going on, but I do know that when they go back and eat traditional food and drink traditional um, herbal teas, they get better. So we're looking to um, research a lot more and experiment with this, with these grains to get it into the daily lifestyle of the people on Tumala Mission and Bogabilla. So for those that aren't familiar with the country up there, and I, I know you've shared personally with me that, um, that the people are grains people and grass people. And so they're, they've grown up surrounded by grasslands. How easy is it for people to get access to the grains when they're living on country or in community like Tumala? Well, first we have to highlight that, that it's a healing, healing thing. And then we'll start looking at the grasses. So it's still all fairly new to us, but we really, really want this to happen in Tumala and Bogabilla and we really, really need it for our health. And um, with traditional healing, it's not just going in and healing one organ, it's a holistic approach to healing. So it heals the mind, everything. It heals the whole body. So the more we go back into our traditional medicines and foods, the healthier our people are going to be. 
and it's accessible. There's grass all around us. There's land all around us. We don't need to go out um, on country as such because we live on country. And people um, are now starting to look back to the country and the native um, plants for food and medicine. So it's a, a great time now to take off and move with, with all you fellas. Move with you. We'll go forward and progress with you while, while there's all that support there. Mm. So what do you think the best thing is um, that we can do to work together? Is it is it knowledge? Is it resources? Is it sharing? Is it eating? It's all those things <laughs> to stay in touch. Um, but we, we're keen too to see what's, um, what's available around us. As you told me yesterday about the Mitchell grass results coming back in 23% natural fibre, and it's nearly twice as, as high as wheat. So that's the way to go, mm. native grains. And then to see all those little pretty products there that Aunty Beryl made, we can't wait to experiment with that sort of stuff now. So thank you for sharing that. So when you've um, when you have started this process of healing with the women and, and the other groups you lead, what are some of the activities that you do to start when you're just beginning? Well, we have to go out and identify the grasses first, and that'll fit in with the um, Garigal project. Um, next Monday, I'm going to take women aside one on one and start looking at the Atlas of Living Australia. So that's when they can start um, identifying and collecting their grasses. We could start with the grasses because they're really keen to get the Johnny Cakes happening. Mm -hmm. We'll start with the grasses. Then have a big cook up by the river. Yes. Yes, that's next Monday if you want to come, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've got 142 people on this webinar, though. Are they all invited as well? They won't fit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so they've, um, they're taking small steps and this um, spot on the river is very special. So everything special, um, the cooking, um, the environment, the place where they're going to have the Johnny Cakes. Um, it's where I used to swim when I was a little kid. So it's a very special place mm. on Tumala. And they don't have any shops. They don't have any um, um, services out here, like they have the health clinic, but um, they have to go to town for banks and shops and things like that. So if they're produce, growing and producing their own grains, it's going to be saving them a lot of money as well as being healthy. Mm. Yeah, we just can't wait to get started. We just want to go. <laughs> and I'm so glad that Ada's um, let me into Tumala and um, there's lots of women here, especially young women, um, I'm quite overwhelmed of how the young women on Tumala um, cope sometimes from day to day and it becomes a bit overwhelming. And when we bring all the cultural um, activities in, people engage that normally don't engage. Mm -hmm. All this stuff works and um, the people prove that it does work. Mm -hmm. So we need to keep it going. We need to keep um, developing and moving forward. Um, but what we will need until we can grow our own, Angela, is we'll need those little supplies that you've been sending us, if possible, please. Until we could grow our own. And I think that's that's something that many communities share, that people are ready, and, and people of all cultures as well, really hungry to start using the grains, but you can't buy them anywhere yet. They're yeah. so precious and rare. Yeah. Um, so it will be a process of, of slowly increasing the number of places where they're grown yep. um, and then sharing the small quantities yep. um, and people planting more. Yep. And with traditional food, I find that you just need little bits, um, just introduce little bits at a time because we're just, um, we're trying to change our lifestyle. We're trying to change our mindset. And that's a big, um, a big move. Um, but everyone's talking about this stuff. Everyone's ready. It's now's the time to really move forward with this stuff. Mm. Um, so you've shared also with me before about the importance of language in connecting people and country and, and foods. Yes. Well, while we're working with um, plants and animals and working for the Atlas of Living Australia, we have access and opportunity to look at plants on country and it does make a difference. Um, 
women have come up with stories out on country that um, we know that they wouldn't have said, you know, if it was in an office or in a room. Um, being out on country triggers their memory and triggers their stories and those stories are like gold. Well, I did get a story from an elder a um, couple of weeks ago about the Nardu grass. And I was told that it's not a very nutritional grass, but um, it keeps you alive, it stops you from starving. And it was just that seed that she remembered from when she was a little girl and she got quite excited. She said, oh, Uncle, Uncle Bunai with his Nardu damper. So she remembered that her old uncle cooking the Nardu damper when she was, she was a little girl. Um, but it brought excitement to her, you know. Whereas if we were in office, she wouldn't have said that. I don't believe she would have said that. Mm. So it's about jogging their memories about the plants and how they used to live and those little stories are just so important now. Mm. Mm. It's the connection, it's the story um, that is the connection mm. to the country. And um, as we're language teachers, we um, we teach them the language word for those plants and animals while we're, while we're looking, collecting. They learn the language and as they put it into the database, they learn the language word for that plant or that animal. Hmm. And this is the Atlas database, is that right? The Atlas of Living Australia. We're, we're not putting anything into the Atlas at this stage. We're just practicing like with Johnny Cakes. <laughs> but we will be soon. Um, they'll be trained up and I'll be trained up as well to um, go and put these um, words into the Atlas. Hmm. The encyclopedia in the sky. So for, for those on the webinar that don't know yet, the, the Atlas of Living Australia is a, it's an, a publicly accessible database of species. And Auntie Bernadette and the team have been adding the Aboriginal, well, the, the Gamilaray words and other languages um, for the species as well. Is that correct, Auntie Bernadette? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so that you can Google that and it'll come up. No problem if anyone wants to access that Atlas. And Camilleroy is the only language, Indigenous language, that's on that website. So we're leading our, our languages, leading the way in, in that respect with the with the encyclopedia. So other languages will will go on there. Mm. We, we're the first. It's wonderful. Mm. Um, before we um, hand off to our next speaker, may I ask you just one question? Um, I'm not an Aboriginal person and I've been very, very blessed to learn from you and learn from many of the other aunties and uncles around on Gomorrah country. What advice would you have to other non-Aboriginal people who really want to engage with native foods and maybe native grains, but don't really know where to start with the cultural um, governance of these things? Um, they need to look at people that are out there, you know, doing things like yourself. Um, I'm sure if someone went to you now that you'd be able to point them to someone in an Indigenous corner where they might be able to get some information. Um, so what, you, I, I, what you're doing is, is vital. It's very important. You're like, you're, like, um, you're like the pin for everyone else to tap into now. And I hope that you stay there and you keep growing because we're going to keep coming back and um, looking for resources and um, hopefully working with you. Wow, that's very gracious of you, Auntie Bernadette. Thank you. I, I feel very inadequate, to be honest. The more I learn, the more I realise I don't know. And I think that's with everyone. So thank you very, very much for those words. Um, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, there's, there's lots of comments and questions that have come up through the chat. And if you want to answer some of those directly while we um, chat to Dr. Keetle as well, you're welcome. And hopefully, if you can stay around, um, at the end, we'll, um, we'll cross back to you again um, yep. with some of those questions. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Gabba, thank you. Um, so we, we're going to, um, it's just been so wonderful hearing these stories. We're now going to hear a little bit more about the science. Um, and I've seen some questions in there about what species names are. And, and, um, and Aunty Bernadette then re referred to Mitchell grass and the, she actually meant the protein content of them. So to hear some of more of those details, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Claudia Keetle and she's going to give some preliminary scientific data on the nutrition of these grains. Um, and Claudia has been teaching and studying the growth and metabolism of plants in different environments for many years. And she's worked on trees such as beech and eucalyptus 
and crops such as tomatoes, wheat, beans and okra. She now researches the biochemistry of plants and their seeds and does things like the composition of the starch, the fiber, the proteins, the fats, and how these things vary with the conditions in which they're growing. So Dr. Keetle, over to you. Hello everyone. Um, greetings from Darawal country um, near Picton. Um, so I would like to pay my respects as well to the elders and I, I am here really, I'm only just scratching the surface of the nutritional properties of these wonderful grains and seeds that, that we've been measuring. So I'd like, just like to show you what we have found only very preliminary and not in, in very much detail, but we're very keen to keep going in this, in this area. So you can see, can you see my slides? Yeah, excellent. So in the background behind me, you can actually see the grains that we put into little crucibles for ashing, which is what we've done to find out mineral content of these grains. And here's just a, some, an overview of some of the flowers that we had available to us. There's wheat in there, there's purslane in there, there's um, Kwondong, which is that blob, uh, blob here. So you can see lots of different colors and, and, and grain size of the flowers. So just a tiny bit of background to give you an idea what we're actually talking about when we talk about nutrition. So plants make a lot of things and we all rely on their composition to feed ourselves for energy, but also for other things like um, fiber. So in, in the carbohydrates, we have the starch, which is very high in modern grains because we have bread for high starch content in seeds. And there's some nice images here of starch grains from a colleague of ours, Professor Les Copeland. And you can see here different grains of starch granules from crops that we that are commonly eaten like potato and rice. And on the side, on the right hand side here, you can see an example of some fiber of plants. So here is an image from a cell wall. And you can see all these strings here that are put together by the plant. And this is an image of this fiber here and the and the molecules they're put together. So we rely mostly on starch for energy. So modern grains have a lot of that starch and maybe 50 to 70% of human energy intake is from starch. Plants also make proteins and fats and they are really important for building muscle, for example, and for uh, essential amino acids. Fats are high in energy and they give us essential fatty acids that are important for brain health, for example. And you can see on the side here some example of, of uh, nuts and seeds high in protein. And maybe we could aim to make one of these for our native grains one day. That would be amazing. So you can see that um, nuts have really high protein content, but also legumes have, like soybeans and native acacia have lots of protein, which I'll show you in a minute. Down here, there's just examples of common oil seeds that are, that are used for oil um, pressing, for example, like flax seed, but this is the, the linseed variety, sesame, um, peanuts, for example, soybean. And then finally, plants also take up these other things that are really important for health, which is minerals and they are making vitamins. So this is just a snapshot for one type of mineral, iron, which is available in the earth's crust, but plants have to, it's, they're not easily available and plants have to take them up using some strategies to help with that. And then they transport it up for the plant and store it in, in the seeds. So if we don't have enough of iron, for example, that can lead to anemia, so you can't concentrate as well, for example. 
So that's just one example of a mineral. So we have measured the composition of some of the, the grain. And I just wanted to show you where in the grain is actually are those, those compounds found that I just talked about. So in the middle here is the endosperm that has the starch in it, but also some protein. So in here you can see that's a, a nice um, micrograph of a wheat kernel. So lots of starch granules here. And this layer here is the alluron layer, which has lots of protein. And then out here, that's the seed coat. And it's very thin, but it contains a lot of minerals. And that's what we often is taken off when you eat white flour. So lots of minerals are lost when you eat polished grains. So whole grains are better. And then inside also you have the embryo. And the embryo is where the, the, the plant grows from, which is also rich in fats and protein. So what did we measure? So we measured some grasses um, and I've, I've given you the species here, kangaroo grass, Mitchell grass, native millet, wheat grass, weeping grass, button grass, and warrego grass. And this is a nice image that I found um, for kangaroo grass, Demeter. And then we measured some herbs and shrubs, the spiny headed mat rush. We measured purslane, which was pigweed, which Auntie Beryl mentioned earlier. And then Altman salt bush, uh, salt bush, sorry. So here are some images of the lamandra, the purslane, and the, the salt bush. And then finally, we measured some trees. So some acacias, three types of acacias, anura, so marga wattle, whipstick wattle, Halls Creek wattle. And then we measured Karajong, which is also, you see an image here. And then finally, we measured Kwandong, which we didn't group with the others because it's very, very high in fat. So we wanted to look at it separately. So I'm gonna show you some overview of those groups. So grasses, trees, shrubs, and, and Kwandong. So what we analyzed at the moment only, which is only scratching the surface, as I said, protein content by Duma combustion for people who would like to know the detail. We measured fat content, how the fat is uh, composed of the different fatty acids. We measured ash, which we are taking as a proxy for mineral composition or content. And then finally, we measured energy of those seeds with bomb calorimetry. So this is an overview of the protein. So you can see the grasses, so they're all grouped here. Uh, um, and the wheat on the right hand side is the comparison. So the wheat had three different types of wheat. So very high protein wheat, which is the pasta wheat, the bread wheat, and we also had a biscuit wheat in there, which is why you can see a bit of spread there. And you can see that the herb species are as high in protein on average as the wheat. Grasses are generally higher in protein than the wheat and the trees, the the uh, acacias and the karajong are very high in protein. So they are between 20, 20 to 23% protein for, for the species that we measured. The fat content, um, again, compared to wheat on the right hand side here. So wheat doesn't have a lot of fat in it. Grasses, the native grasses have a bit, quite a bit higher fat content. Herbs even more, that is without the quandal. So that is just the lamandra, the purslane, and the, what's the third one, sawbush. And then the tree species have really, really high fat content. So acacias are very, very high nutrient rich, both protein and fat contents are very high, but also karajong is, is very high in fat and protein. And then finally, the mineral overview. So you can see wheat is quite low. The native grasses have higher mineral content and maybe that was partly caused by it being really difficult to thresh. So there might have been more of the seed coat and other things in there to, to give the higher mineral content. 
but it's about double of what wheat has. And then the, the herb species have a huge variation of, of ash content. And obviously we don't know exactly what the ash is. It could be calcium, could be sodium or other things. And the trees are again, higher than wheat, but it's lower because it's very full of the other things like protein and, and fat. So the, it's not just that they're full of fat and, and energy, but they also have really good fats in them. So you can see on the right hand side here, the red things are the polyunsaturated fats, which are the healthy fats and the monounsaturated fats like olive oil has, for example, and then the saturated fats, which is like butter, for example. And you can see that a lot of the oils contained in, in all of them is very high in the unsaturated fats up to 80%. So wheat also has about 80%, but because there's a lot of fat there, you, you would be taking up much more of those fats if you ate those seeds, for example. So we have looked um, into the, the types of fats. So there's some that have really high monounsaturated fats. So very similar to olive oil, for example. And others have um, poly very high omega-3 fats. So purslane particularly stands out with that. So I'm just gonna show you an overview of some of the results for some specific uh, seeds that we analyzed. And if you'd like, you know, just ask, I have, I have the results for all of them. So bread wheat, just as a comparison, you can see protein on average is about 14 and a half grams, two and a half grams of fat, and about 70 grams of carbohydrates. And a lot of that is, is starch. I should say that we did analyze fiber for the native grains, but it's not complete, but they were much, much higher in fiber compared to wheat as well. So yeah, we're still working on that. Hopefully we can add that later on to, to the knowledge base. This is Mitchell grass. So Mitchell grass has much higher protein. So this is getting close to legume protein content. So the range here is just because it's an estimate of protein. So we have to calculate it with the multiplier that is normally used for wheat. So 21 and a half or the multipliers that are used for other species, so 23 and a half. So that's a really high protein content. Again, about double the fat to wheat and a lot of that is unsaturated. It also has more ash than the wheat. So this was a really good candidate for high protein content, for example. We have no idea what other good properties these grasses have at the moment. There might be really good you know, um, phenolics in there and all these other good things that make people healthy overall. Kangaroo grass was another one that has, was really high in protein. So about 17 to 19 grams per 100 grams very high in fat, even more double than what um, Mitchell grass had, so nine grams of fat and very high ash, so 10 grams of, of ash. And I'll be very keen to find out what, what the composition is of, of this uh, mineral content. Weeping grass was another one, a bit lower in protein, so 13 and a half to 14. Uh, grams, uh, 15 grams per 100 gram, lower in fat and um, a bit lower in minerals, but higher carbohydrate, which might be um, fiber, we don't know. We, we still have to measure what the composition is exactly. Okay, now we're moving to the, the tree species. So Acacia anura, which is marga wattle had very high protein, 23 and a half to 26 grams nearly. Very high fat, 11 grams, and also some mineral about double the one of, of, of wheat, I believe. 
The next one is a whipstick wattle. It's a beautiful seed with the yellow. So when you grind this up, it makes a yellow and black um, flower, which is beautiful. Protein is a bit lower, but fat is much higher. So it, that is interesting to see that different wattles have quite different composition. Some are high in fat. So mulga had 11 grams. This one had double the fat and about the same amount of ash, for example. And then this is Karajong. So we looked at this at the kernel, um, which again was quite high in protein, very high fat, 20, nearly 20 grams of fat, and a lot of that unsaturated, and similar amounts of ash. And then this is the corn dog. Um, and you can see the fat content is is 60 percent nearly so that is very high and still a lot of that is unsaturated and actually it's um high in um in oleic acid which is the same acid that is in fatty acid that is found in in olive oil for example so this this would be a good candidate for pressing and then purslane which is often overlooked and considered a weed. But purslane is, is also what Aunt, Auntie Betty cooked with. It's really high in minerals and very high in omega-3 fatty acids. So this is a really nutritious um, seed. They're very tiny, as yes, you can see how small they are. But you can also eat the, the fleshy stems in salads, for example. It might not be as high in protein, as the seed, but it's still nutritious and has omega-3 fats in it. So overall, they are more nutritious, have more protein and minerals than wheat, and some have particularly high levels of unsaturated fatty fats and omega-3 fats. But we, we have to analyze way more seed to get a better handle on the variability from when they've grown in different areas of the country, for example, but also the variation between species. And we still need to look at much more into the detail of the composition, what types of protein, what types of starch, what types of minerals, and how, how high the fiber content is. So thanks very much for listening. And let me know if you would like to see other results or if you have any questions. Thank you, Claudia. That was amazing. I've just ignored all the chat, sorry. So I don't know what people have been asking. Plenty of questions um, about the composition, more detailed information from the FAME analysis. Have we done fibre, which I know you answered. Um, the answer is yes. Um, we're still processing the results. Um, so feel free if you want to um, go back and answer some of those directly in the chat, Claudia, if you want because um, we've got one more speaker and it's actually set of speakers to go to today. But if you can hang around as well, Claudia, at the end, um, we've got some time to thank you all together. Just hang around, that'd be great. Um, so for our last speaker and set of speakers for today, uh, we're going to head back out to Walgut. So we're going to join Rhonda Ashby and the Walgut Wiringar, which means women. Um, so this women's group has been meeting to reconnect with people, food and country. And they've been experimenting with the same flowers that Auntie Beryl experimented with as well. And they've been out cooking just this morning, um, preparing the barbecue. There's 10, 10 or so women there ready to show us what they've baked out at Walgut. So Rhonda um, and the Walgut Wiringa, over to you guys. Are you there? Yama. Uh, we're just on a phone camera, so it's very challenging to, to get around. Yama. Um, first of all, I want to start off um, by acknowledging Aunty Faye Green is one of our elders here in um, Walgut, and also Diane Walford, who's one of the participants um, with the Garibal project. So we might just start off with an acknowledgement first. I'd just like to my name is Ray Green, uh, and welcome to what we're uh, experiencing today. And I also would like to acknowledge our um, elders, past and present. 
I'm dying, Kennedy Walford. I'm a um, Gamilaroi true blue woman dedicated to my people and my land. I have a 94 year old mother that I care for and still she lived off all this all this food and she's still survived and she's good as gold. And and I'd like to um, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, and then I have a young young lad that I brought along to learn today to learn him how to make Johnny cake. And your name is? Clario Victor. We might just go around to the other women. We have a young student here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dana Ashby. Um, I'm a Grimillory woman, currently still at school studying. Um, I thought it was a good opportunity to come down today and learn about my culture and sit around buildings and yarn. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Wendy. I'm one of the McKillop workers uh, supporting the the project and um, yeah, so enjoying it. Uh, we've been learning a lot on country. Uh, we've got some little background material here, but we've um, been learning through this journey. Um, yeah, so we've been going on country and just looking after our well-being because well, it's been through a lot um, with the grieving and loss of people in our community and the COVID-19 isolation with our elders and stuff. But yeah, so um, we think this is a good project. Um, it suits Walgett and we're enjoying it. And we're looking forward to more. Yeah. Hello, my name's Jenny. I'm just a pillar of the community, mate. Hi, my name's Michelle. I'm a local Okay, just a little bit about the project we've been doing here. Um, the ladies also made their um, aprons. aprons and um, we've also had some kind donations from the community. Um, the Garigold Project, which is a part of the um, Atlas, Living, Living Australian Atlas, and also um, we've, we also got support from Solaro with that. Um, the project has been going for the last few months. We've been going out on country trying, trying to identify some of the plants, um, especially the grasses. I think it's um, important that we identify the grasses because it plays a, a significant role with our sunlight. Now, we've got mothers here, so we also have babies. So, um, yeah, that's just a part of the package here. Um, <laughs> take one, take us all. <laughs> so, identifying some of the grasses. Um, We've been doing a collection. There's some grasses we don't know, but we'll, you know we're researching those grasses. One of the popular one was the kangaroo grass, and we also have some um, flower there of the kangaroo grass, um, and the the weeping grass. Also, um, the millet grass is a is a very favourable one. It's, it's a nice tasting, and not just with the grasses, also the plants. We've been um, getting the seeds from the plants and, you know, starch could come from plants and flour can come from starch. Um, and not far from where we are in Walgut, there's a, about an hour's drive, it's a place called Cuddy Springs. Um, Cuddy Springs, um, 65,000 years ago, there was a stone that had some starch on it, a grinding stone, and they backdated that to 65,000 years. Um, and that was a woman who invented that bread. So that throws the, the rocks off the Egyptian um, walls over there of their bread making, which is 13,000 years. So we were the first bread makers and proudly enough, women. Um, I just want to throw that in. But some of the stuff we've been um, working with, um, you know, we've got the dark emu, we've got our dictionaries, um, local knowledge, um, We've been making flashcards with um, specimens of the plants we've been collecting out on country. Um, language has been a vital role of it. Um, our old people and our young ones and just getting community involved. Some of the bread we made this morning, I talk a lot too, sorry. Some of the bread we made this morning, um, this was made out of weeping, weeping grass. It's a bit darker. Um, we also um, got away from the salt and used our old man salt bush. Um, 
Only thing we're not using is the river water. <laughs> yeah. And that's not safe to use these days. But um, we've been using um, parajong, um, acacia seeds. Um, we've also been working with the grasses weaving. Um, the most important thing, we, we don't want to look at this as a, a commodity. We want to look at this as a healing. I think our people need to heal first with country and country needs to heal with us. So we're not looking at this as a money, a commodity thing. We're looking at this as a healing and getting healthy diets back into our communities and that well-being for our people and our children. So we've got to think about our old people before us and the pathways and the legacies they left for us and for us to pass that on to our young, one, young ones. Um, I think that's very important to think about them old people and them young ones. And we've got work to do for that. And this, this is work. This is the best work we could do in a community grassroot base level. Um, yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. I can see the, the um, confidence and the empowerment of the women since the Garagol project um, has started. Garagol in the Milroy language means um, gaps. So we believe there's, there's gaps with um, Western science, with traditional science, not us as with the traditional science, but Western, Western science need to fill those gaps up um, where traditional science um, didn't have any gaps with our native foods and grains and um, way of life. We've also been working with, um, also with the animals too, um, especially around um, our seed. We've been doing season calendars, um, so documenting and collecting data for around those seasons and trying to bring back some of our storylines and song lines as well. Because you know, with the Seven Sisters, those grasses were very important with those song lines and storylines. So that's, I, I'm not gonna do any more talking now. So if these ladies wanna add on to something. Yeah. And I've started off with McKillops um, in Walgett uh, to, for this pilot project. And with the COVID-19 restrictions, it only allows us to have 10 here. Um, there's been a lot more women and community members um, wanting to come along, but because of the restrictions, um, yeah, we had to stick to that limit. But the interest is there to, to open it up um, for, you know, for community. Um, since I've started the at McKillops, I've um, worked in with the Women's Yarn Up group. This is where this was initiated from. Um, and Di Walford, she has a group here also, um, young mothers and babies. So that's... Yeah, the play group. So in that's been young, young Indigenous families into the group. Yeah. Play groups. So that's been in, implemented into her group now. So you can see the growth with this as well. And we can show the garden. We might just start a garden over there with our, with our group. So we, because we've got um, in Walgut, Walgut is a um, it's a community where um, from government policies where we've been separated in the um, three groups here. We, we have the town, we have Gingi, and we have Nemoi. And that's no fault of um, us as people. It's, it's the fault of government and their policies. So it's trying to bring those mobs back in as one. Um, and now with this project, we're starting to get out there, um, out to Gingi and out to Nemoi and also in town, working with the women and doing um, gardens, um, native gardens out in those communities. We've got some land, given that um, some, uh, some yeah, land, family. some land has been, person. some land has been given to us to do a market garden from one of the teachers, the ag teachers at the school here. Um, so he's opened up that space uh, for us to have a native garden. He's also, he's also the ag teacher. So he, he will come in for assistance there as well and help us out. So that's us. I'm not going to say any more, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful, Rhonda. Do any of the other women um, or the kids want to share anything else about what they've done today? Because I can kind of see on the table when the camera goes down. Oh, sorry. We made some jolly a whole lot of food that's been eaten. <laughs> it must have tasted good. Yeah, they were nice. Yeah. We, um, we actually made Johnny cakes and... Um, in what is it? We actually made Johnny cakes and um, included like native grains in the Johnny cakes. So this grain, this Johnny cake is 
weeping grass. Is a weeping grass, and it's not no flower, just a little bit of flower included. And so, as you can see, it came out pretty brown. So like, yeah, yeah, protein, a little protein. Oh, I just want to ask Sunny a question. Um, and if I, um, as a community elder, what do you think about um, groups like this doing what we've been doing here today? What do you think about the group here, what we've been doing here, being involved? I'm, I'm very proud of the young people. Uh, I've been around quite a while and I've worked a lot with um, um, education, um, getting education for our kids. I've been working in schools and things, but I participate with the community and I always there to support them on everything they do that's in cultural ways. So I, I'm very proud that these young women see today will keep on continuing their cultural ways and, and their, their ways of living. We lived off the land and they still continue to including still continue to do that and I, and that's make me so proud of them and I'm, I'll support them with everything they do in cultural ways and especially this year so they asked me down today I wasn't wasn't expecting something but they said was very <laughs> important and it is important it's important for me as an elder to be here with them and supporting them and to everything that they I could give them some information on things because I've lived on a mission and we lived off the land. We need know a lot of the bushes that they, they I could explain to them about and some things I can't. But yes, I think it's just the same as our language that we've lost. I support them at the, we've got our languages and culture back in the school and they teach in our language now. And I supported that all through the evening. So while if I'm on this land, I will always support yes. the young people in the cultural ways. And and what I've learned from, from my learning of, from early people, well, I'll teach them. And I still got a, a couple of young, early people around and I'm very proud of, and that's Diane's mum. So if I want if I want to get some information or I'm not quite sure of myself, well I'll go to Wendy. Or I'll go to my sisters, they older than me. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for allowing that. But before we go, I just want to um say, you know, like our our people were we were farming this country well before well before a um, a, a, well before a white man put his foot on these soils, um, um, and we farm our people farm this land without any machinery, without any dollar. And she cut me off. No, we're off then. That's all good. Oh, yeah. That's it. That's Rhonda, it. we can see you, but we lost you for a second. Would you be able to say that last bit again, please? Sounds oh. very special. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I just want to say, um, you know, before um, any white men step a foot on to our soils in this country, um, our people were farming this land without, without any machinery, without a dollar. Um, we worked in with the natural environment, with our foods, our medicines, with our well-being, our social life. Um, and you know that that connection we have with country um, is very special. It's an emotional, spiritual. You know, it just the list goes on. Um, and I think if we can get back out and start practicing um, uh, some of our cultural practices, like with the, the grasses, collecting the grasses and the seeds and, and our bush foods and medicine, I think there's a big shift there now. And I think there's a big shift for women to step up now. We've, I know we've always...
has been beyond um, the men. And I think we need to step up and, and be um, beside the men and walk together. Um, I think the most important thing, we all need to work together for our children and our old people to, you know, for this to continue. Yeah, but I just want to say thanks to, um, thanks to you, Mob, for allowing the Walbert um, Wirringar to be a part of this today. And also to you, Angela, with the um, Sydney University and I think it's the Blend Plant Breeding um, Institute in Arabri and the local land council there that opened up that space for us um, to do a workshop over in Narrabri, I think it was um, with Bruce Pascoe at the time. That really opened our eyes and I don't think we'd be on this journey if we if we weren't open up to that space. So at the bottom of my heart, I just want to say thank you, Angela. Um, and thank you to Uncle Bruce Pascoe and, um, you know, allowing us to be a part of that journey with him also. Thank you. Thanks, oh. Hi, Joe. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your kind words. And definitely thank you very, very much for sh sharing your story and showing us what you've been cooking out there. There's lots of people in the chat that have been saying from all over Australia saying hello and saying thank you for sharing and they agree and they loved what you said um, and what you've brought to the conversation today. And this is only the start. Knowledge sharing doesn't stop, hey? It continues as we work together. So thank you again, all the women and the aunties and the kids that have been cooking. And um, if you have any other thoughts or you wanna connect again, please do stay in touch. There's lots of people in the group that are, that are gonna to wanna to hear updates on what you cook next and what you collect next um, and the next stage in your journey. Um, there's so much we can all learn from what you guys are getting up to. Um, and there's, there's one, um, one more thing I'd like to say is, is today really is about, like I said, knowledge sharing. It's not about lectures and we've got two more sessions to go. And so um, just as we close, we've gone a bit over time. So just as we close, I want to give opportunity. I know there's people listening as well that um, do have important stories to share, um, but they also might know where we can buy these grains um, or, or people that are supplying the grains or who we can talk to for more knowledge or more resources um, that are local to different places around Australia. So if you would like to use the chat box now for the last couple of minutes before we close um, to put, put in that space any resources that you know about, so links to videos or websites um, that you would like to share with the wider group um, so that we can all find out what everyone else is doing. This is a, a small space, but a big space to be working in. And um, there's lots of places um, dotted around Australia that are doing lots of little things um, that can contribute to the bigger picture. And there have been a lot of questions in the chat, and I get this all the time, where can we buy these grains? Um, so if you are a supplier, please do let us know if, if you've got some that you're happy for other people to, to call you up or contact you to buy from you um, or to trade. Um, but from what I know, there aren't very many places right today that you could buy from, but I'd say after this harvest season, I know for sure Black Duck Foods will have some product. Um, and they're going to be other companies that have product at the end of this summer. Um, so grains are getting harvested now. Um, they should be on the first little bits should be on the market in the next few months. Um, so without that, I'd, I'd like to just thank again all of our speakers coming from the different countries, um, Auntie Beryl and Auntie Bernadette, um, the Walgut Wurringar and Dr. Claudia Keetle. Thanks for joining us so much. Um, and while everyone's writing notes in the chat box, um, with updates and websites and whatnot. I'd just like to remind um, the people that if you were emailed a separate link this morning from Cara Jeffrey um, to join a separate discussion after this, you just need to close this window to be able to access that. So just close this webinar and then click on the link that Cara sent you this morning um, and that will take you to the discussion for those that were emailed that separate link. And I'm sorry, it's a bit confusing. Um, but for the rest of us, thank you again for joining. Um, enjoy Melbourne Cup Day. And um, to those down in Victoria, have a good public holiday. We'll um, be back again after NAIDOC week. Enjoy NAIDOC week next week. And um, two weeks, 11 a.m. on Tuesday, we'll be back for session two, which will be on growing, harvesting and species selection. So have a great afternoon.
and we'll join you again another day. Bye.